Returning guest host Eric Long is here to talk news from Beachhead and ConnectWise, big increases in risky user behavior and how to make work from home security work, plus a special guest interview with Tim Fitzgerald from Ingram Micro. It's Channel Port Weekly, episode 161, The Mandalorian. Hello and welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode 161. My name is Matt with Oxford, technology editor, online director, and your host of this show for for you. And who are you? Well, you're the VARs, the emig- uh, the, the the integrators, uh, all of those, Rich, all of those things that uh, sound like sound like it has something to do with technology and business. And those people out there are able to talk without tripping over their own tongue, which I have yet to learn. Joining me this week and most weeks is someone who also does not trip over his own tongue when speaking. Uh, but sometimes it hangs down and pants like a dog when he gets hot up there in Seattle because he's not used to the heat uh, or the smoke. Executive Editor Rich Freeman. Hey there. And guess what? The smoke is long gone. Isn't that a it, wonderful it, thing? Is it, is it, finally, it finally dissipated. It did. It did. So uh, last Friday, we, we, you know, and we were just, I woke up that morning, we were still, you know, saturated um, uh, in smoke and uh, it's, it rained that day. And uh, so uh, Friday morning, the, the uh, uh, air quality officially was unhealthy, according to the federal government's, you know, rating system. And by Saturday morning, it was good. And ever since then, it's been good. So I can breathe once more. That's good. And so you haven't had to do a lot of panting lately. I know when you get hot, that tongue flaps out and, you know, there's drool everywhere. It, uh, it hasn't been hot either, yeah. So not, not as much panting uh, as usual and, and less drool. <laughs> Always good to hear about less drool. Um, you know who also likes to hear about less drool is our uh, guest host that we have today. Uh, we're excited to have him back. This will be his third time on the show. Uh, and he has over 25 years of experience. The technology sector has created and sold a number of companies, including one of the first broadband internet providers in Florida. He currently serves on the CompTIA Executive Council for IT Services and Support and regularly speaks at industry events. Please welcome the president of TerraCloud, Eric Long. Welcome, Eric. Hey, how are you guys doing? It is great to have you back. Now, are you, uh, the, the last time that we did a show with you, you were in your, you were in your RV in Parts Unknown. Uh, are, we still, are we still in the RV today? Nope, the RV is uh, parked outside the place, um, and we are in a new house back in Florida, uh, heading back to Dallas next week, more than likely. So, and three times, surprising it's been three times. So you guys either have a really short memory or we did okay, one of the two. <laughs> I'm gonna think it's probably the memory thing, but I, yeah. I usually I usually say that uh, if, you, if you come back, it means that you had, a, you had at least a decent time, but if you come back three times, you're just a glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> that I am. <laughs> so no, it's really, it is really great to have you here. Uh, for those who may have missed those previous episodes, please tell us a little bit about you, a little about TerraCloud, what you do. I have TerraCloud. We're an MSP with a strong focus on security. Uh, we're based out of Dallas, and then we're scattered all over the place. So we got a lot of little small offices in different geographies. Um, I, I tend to split my time up between Dallas and Florida, and um, we're down in Houston and up in Oklahoma, and you know, have RV. We'll wander. Good. And uh, and and that RV. Uh, what I don't know. If we talked a little bit about it that last time, but what uh, what kind of RV is it? That is a fifth wheel, uh, which is uh, the kind that sits in the bed of, you know, that connects into the bed of a very, very large truck. Okay, so <laughs> it's, a, so it's a very heavy. not necessarily an RV with the integrated car. It's not, that. well, that would be a class A where you're driving the thing. No, this is a tow behind, uh, but they're very large. So this one's 44 feet long. So pretty Ooh, good that size. Is, that is a big two, ba- two bathrooms, big bedrooms. Yeah, it's big. How many, how many slide outs does it have on it? it that one has five. Five, five slide outs yeah yeah wow very cool That's less like less slide outs better for anybody wanting to buy an rv or if anybody wants any free rv advice you know of what not to do i've learned most of those things already but that but the slide outs make them seem so much bigger on the inside it does yep, it does so, if only they made those for other things but let's not even go there but what are well what are the downsides <laughs> of the slide outs uh, because things break. RVs, uh, things have the propensity to break. And so you've got five times the motors if you didn't have any slides. Actually, you know, a lot of people are buying older RVs when they didn't put slides in them for simplicity's sake. So yeah, it's just maintenance, maintenance. That's, uh, maintenance. that's the big thing on pretty much everything, be it boat, RV, or, you know, any other toy. <laughs> so, so Eric, you are the exact kind of per- person I was starting to talk about uh, in the beginning of the show, and I decided that I could no longer talk. Uh, but you are the MSP, the VAR, the integrator, the, uh, the cloud services kind of provider. Um, so you've been doing that for a long time. What, what got you into that in the beginning? And 
Um, how have you been able to stay relevant and focused and up to date as uh, things have propelled forward? Uh, well, I'm a reform VAR. So back in the day, yeah, we did call ourselves one of those things. We've been kind of more cloud centric for the past decade, I would say. Um, and, and, and even back, you know, in the 90s, we were doing a lot of cloud focused things, even though we didn't call it the cloud. We, since we were a DSL provider and we had a lot of broadband wireless networks, we were connecting uh, remote sites together for clients and putting VPNs in between them and doing all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, the... Um, I guess the progression was, you know, back in the day when we used to kick people off computers, we'd walk in somebody's office and, you know, work on the computer, kick them off and do a check disk and, a, you know, and that kind of stuff and just kind of, you know, progressed as the industry changed. So it's uh, it's been a long, a long haul, but a good one. You know, I'm, I'm always interested. Um, I, I know of, of plenty of uh, MSPs and, and reseller solution providers out there who have offices in uh, multiple cities. Uh, I mean, it, it, typically those cities tend to be clustered in a region or, or, or something. But the companies I know that have, you know, that do business, say in Dallas and, and Florida, it, like you do, that tends to come about because of, you know, merger and acquisition kind of activity. And um, there's usually like an executive team at that, that distant um, location that's helping to kind of run things. I don't know as many people like you who are, are running a business that kind of geographically distributed um, without that, and, and my uh, recollection is you don't have an enormous team. You've got a very good team, but it's not like you've got 50 people working with you. So I'm curious, I mean, how, how did that come about? And what, what are like the, the pluses and minuses basically of doing business over that big an area? You know, how did that come about? You know, I moved the headquarters there. We were kind of following one of our clients that was growing dramatically. I mean, dramatically. A huge, huge uh, client was my biggest client. And they started opening offices in different regions. And so I spent a lot of time in the Dallas market. And I just, I liked it there. And it, it was, there was a lot more activity than, we'll say, Tampa Bay, where, where I'm at right this particular second, which is a hotbed of IT activity for some reason, but it is. And um, it just seemed it was more central. It was easier to get around the country and to get to more places and to reach more people. Um, that was the positive side of it. it. Made it look bigger than we are, smarter, or, you know, kind of, you know, smoke and mirrors type of thing. Um, we do have a really good team. We also do a lot of partnering. So we partner with a lot of, uh, we do a lot of coopetition, partner with a lot of contractors to do things like dynamics and, and things that we don't have, you know, the development. For instance, um, we are starting to do some no code, low code stuff internally, but uh, you know, we're not hiring Java people or anything along those lines, but we do partner for, for opportunities like that. Also SharePoint, um, met quite a few people actually even through Channel Pro that we've, uh, we've had some good partnerships through. Uh, the complexities, oh my God, you wouldn't believe it. You gotta have two sets of everything, but sometimes three. I have like three sets of golf clubs now in different locations, kind of scatter them around. Uh, I am gonna be moving most of the, my, my life back to Florida because I got grandkids growing up, things like that, and then just popping over to Dallas as need be. Um, but I did get a couple key people over in the Dallas market. So, you know, hopefully that can, you know, do a lot of the, the, the legwork and the groundwork for, for me. Um, and one of my, one of my good friends said many, many years ago, and I took the advice to heart is you'll never get rich doing all the work himself, yourself. Um, you know, you, you've got to get the right people on board, but in, um, yeah, the last four years, especially the last three years have been utter mayhem. And, you know, like I say, having different sets of clothes and, and then forgetting where you leave things, uh, you know, if I had that, that, you know, that iPad in somewhere and you know, I just can't remember where I put the damn thing. So yeah, it's a little complex. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for most people. Not Look, good. Some, some people would say that having three sets of golf clubs is, is a positive in their life. I can't hit any of them. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just bought three sets and figured out, you know, okay, which one, Oh, that one's really good. No, that was only good that one time. And uh, yeah, so now it's uh, yeah, three sets of anything's probably not great for, but, but I, I know how the, the lifestyles, the lifestyle of the millionaire, the rich and famous people, whatever that show used to be with Robin Leach, I think it was, um, they had people to carry the stuff around for them. You know, me, not so much. If I'm going to put something somewhere, I got to bring it myself. So it's not quite as glamorous as it might sound. You know, um, it, it's, it, we're going to follow up with you at some point in 2021 because, um, I've been working on the uh, the editorial calendar for next year, and there there will be a story on the editorial calendar about partnering with other partners. You know, it's it, it's a topic we've covered before, but not um, uh, terribly recently. Um, so, I mean, just off the top of your your head, I mean, what what you know, what, what are some uh, some do's and don'ts in terms of uh, who you partner with and and how you partner with them? 
Well, I think you need, they get need to be good quality people first and foremost, which are not hard to find in, in the business, especially, you know, going through, uh, through industry associations, things like that. You know, I've met a lot of channel pro members, a lot of Ingram, uh, SMB Alliance. We happen to be involved in SMB Alliance, uh, met many lifelong friends that I've, you know, I've known for 30 years plus now that, you know, they've stayed at my place. I've stayed at their place. I've gone up to their lake cabin, you know, up in Lake Texas and things like that. So, um, you know, just, just build those relationships over time. It's a hell of a lot easier to do it in person, though. This whole virtual thing is like, I mean, obviously, you know, all of us are kind of like in, in a different state now from the, yeah, how many trips would we have done already this year and how many new people would we have met? Um, but, uh, you know, all those, all those people I've met in the past, we stay connected and, you know, an opportunity comes up. I know that I've got somebody in, in Boston or I know somebody in Seattle or I know somebody, I don't know anybody in Portland because that, place is a mess but i know somebody in seattle so uh you know that's that's long you know long-term uh life benefit of of you know establishing those kind of relationships but got to be the right people you know quality and uh and uh, you know you got to do your due diligence so you say quality people those not made in china is what you're saying <laughs> actually i met a couple of chinese people i, I just can't I, speak with them <laughs> i'm joking that was just I, there, there was a made in china joke there somewhere that uh, had to be said even though this I might was, be made in china <laughs> <laughs> that is a nice shirt so for those who are watching it eric is where uh for those who are listening eric is wearing this really bright blue kind of flowery hawaiian shirt where did you get that where, you, where do you get a shirt like that hawaii well that there you go <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we're going to move to news. <laughs> uh, Rich, so uh, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. Let's move to news. That's a good idea. Uh, Beachhead Solutions has added something to Simply Secure. What did they add? We wait with bated breath. So this, this is a, uh, it's kind of a sign of the times story. So, I mean, if you are a Beachhead Solutions partner, um, this is going to be very interesting news as well. But from a broader perspective, this is just kind of an interesting indicator of um, something that, you know, from my perspective in the last 12 months, let's say 12 to 18 months has become uh, a bigger deal, and which is this whole idea of co-managed uh, IT services. So Beachhead Solutions makes a, uh, a security product for um, uh, laptops and other mobile devices. Um, it basically uh, uh, enables you to define various conditions under which you will, you know, automatically quarantine or even potentially uh, eliminate, kill uh, a device that uh, is in an insecure state. Um, now, they typically, and well, in fact, all the time, up until very recently, the way this product worked, and this was written right into the license agreement and the contract, is you as an MSP set the policies, you um, enforce the policies. Basically, the end user benefits from the security functionality but can't really touch any of it. And the, the reasoning behind that was essentially that they were concerned about the, the scenario where that end user is some small office where the receptionist is also the IT person and what if they kind of mess things up and put, put themselves into an insecure state. We want somebody with the right skills to be controlling the, the platform. And so the, the license, the contract you signed with Beachhead said, you know, you as the MSP have administrative rights, you can't share any of that access um, with your end users. Well, that's a problem if you are an MSP in a co-managed IT relationship with some or all of your customers. And, and for folks who are new to that terminology, the, the whole co-managed IT model is one in which um, a mid-sized business, typically one large enough to have its own IT department, signs up with an MSP. And from that point, there are kind of different ways that people will do it. But um, typically, the MSP will share their tool set with the, uh, the end user, and most of the time that, that in-house IT department is kind of doing the day-to-day -day management stuff. If they run into an issue that they can't fix, they need help with something, they'll reach out to the MSP uh, and collaborate on that. And that's, that's the co-managed IT, of it. you're both uh, managing that environment. Um, and so Beachhead has been hearing from enough of their MSP partners who are doing co-managed IT and, you know, basically they want the ability to extend to those co-managed clients the, the um, access to the solution, the ability to control the solution. And of course, in those cases, we're talking about, you know, trained IT professionals. This isn't the receptionist who's going to be uh, getting at the, uh, the control panel. It's somebody who knows what they're doing with maybe a little bit of uh, training and so on. 
Um, and so, you know, it, the interesting thing about this, there was no functionality added to the product. You, you always had the ability, theoretically, um, to extend uh, administrative rights or at least extend access to the interface to your customers. You just weren't allowed to do so. And so what Beachhead has done um, is essentially rewrite its contract. So if, if, if you sign up with them from today forward, there will be language in there that allows you under certain circumstances to give an end user um, direct access to the system. Uh, if you are an existing Beachhead partner, they have probably by now already contacted you and given you the option of approving an addendum to your existing contract that also gives you these, uh, these new rights. Um, and they're creating, you know, training videos. They're, they're taking some additional steps to make sure that the uh, the end users who do access the system know what they're doing. They they have limited um, access to some functionality. So there are certain things like policy setting that only the MSP can do still. Um, but for the basic day to day kind of stuff, you know, responding to an alert kind of stuff rather than make the end user call the MSP and wait for a response and so on. Now, if you you have a co-managed client, you can uh, give it to them and, and uh, uh, give the interface to them and let them do it on their own. And uh, to circle all the way back to the beginning, I mean, what makes this a, a sign of the times is the degree to which this co-managed model has been taking off in the, the uh, MSP world. I just, you know, it seems like every week I'm, I'm hearing from people who have begun doing that and have very positive things for the most part to say about it. And um, certainly in the last six months, you know, talking with uh, big vendors in the industry, Datto, Kaseya, et cetera, it's a trend that they repeatedly bring up without me having to kind of prompt them about it. It's some of their most successful MSP partners are doing business now with mid-sized companies on a co-managed kind of basis because of the, I mean, essentially because of the pandemic and, you know, these IT departments are overwhelmed. They're dealing with um, remotely based employees. They, they, they don't know as much about remote management as a typical MSP does. So an MSP contract or relationship sounds more appealing um, <clears throat> to mid-sized businesses now. And so you, you're seeing a lot more, even more um, co-managed IT and uh, and therefore you're starting to see companies like Be Beachhead reflect that in their products. That is a perfect segue to ask Eric. Eric, now are you doing more, any, any co-managed IT I should say, or are you doing more of it now than you used to? I think we're seeing a trend. Uh, it, it's on the, on the, um, definitely on the incline. I think we're, we're going to, we're seeing more, uh, opportunities around it allows us to reach out to those mid-market smaller than mid-market companies you know the higher end of the smb spectrum i would say uh you know it's funny uh, and there's there is a facebook group out there uh that uh, for co-managed it if you just search for that and you can join that group there's a lot of chatter on it right now and there's a lot of new members and everybody's kind of talking about it you know we've been doing it for a long time we've worked with a number of it departments and, and we typically don't like that that is not our you know that's that that's not our our uh our in our wheelhouse as a general rule of thumb although i think we're probably going to be forced to expand into it because people are asking for it we find that you know a lot of it departments and it people are notoriously lackluster and they are not up to speed you know as far as their their tech you know they don't know how to change a pc out and they know how to work an active directory but you know in the with the security threats and the landscape, they think they can buy, you know, a, a, a skew of a, a particular, you know, vendors, EDR or something along those lines. And then they're all set. Actually, one just told me that the other day. I said, no, we're all good on security. I, I added this particular vendor's EDR. Yeah, we're, we're good now. So, you know, and it's hard to deal directly with the IT department. You know, they, if they do have a budget, it's typically kind of low. So if you can get in a co-managed IT, this has been my experience so far, I think it's going to continue to play out this way is you gotta be having a conversation with the C-level people, you know, and, and having them tell the IT guys what they're gonna do, not, not the other way around, because it just doesn't work in the reverse very well. And it's not, they're not profitable unless you can get, you know, a, a decent engagement and, and a real suite of services and, you know, with clear definitions of, of uh, responsibilities and, you know, who's supposed to be doing what, because you could get blamed for whatever, you know, if, if one IT guy doesn't do his job. Yeah, I mean, th there are definitely pluses and minuses with this model. And I mean, just listening to you talk, it reminds me we had, uh, um, and I don't know if you know him or not, um, Vince Tinarello was a, a oh, guest host. Uh, yeah, I'm probably through CompTIA, you, you know, Vince. And um, so he was a guest host with us. And we, we happened to talk about co-managed IT on that uh, episode. 
And um, he, his experiences, you know, East as of whenever that was a few months ago, have not been good ones. And, and he really, it's, it's sort of like you, would really rather not do it. Um, it would be interesting to check in with him uh, again. I remember he, he was on a panel at one of the very few conferences I went to this year um, where co-managed IT came up. And, uh, and he was like the one guy on stage who was just, no, we tried it, didn't work, not really interested. I'm wondering if, um, if like you, if he's getting enough interest in it from customers that maybe he's had to uh, rethink uh, doing that and just you know figure out a, a way to approach it that shields you from some of those uh, potential downsides. Yeah, I'd, I'd urge uh, the other MSPs maybe to jump on that Facebook group and kind of get the consensus viewpoint because you know, you're gonna have a thousand people providing impact or, or feedback, not just one or two and get an idea what the ins and outs are. But you know, I think it's a viable market if you price it appropriately you know, and, and, and have decent margin. Well, that goes back to a discussion about tools because obviously Beachhead, like this product, it was not something that you could really do a co-managed model with well. Are we seeing a lot more, um, do a lot more other tools like support co-managed models right now? Or are we seeing a, another shift with these tools kind of catching up and being extensible to the end user, but in ways that maybe doesn't give them full administrative access? How, how are the tools supporting this? When we say end user, we're talking literally that the tech support guys that are gonna be inside these co-managed clients. So, you know, um, yeah, they're fine with using them. They're they're multi-tenant out of the box, uh, uh, you know. And and what we try to do is align them with our our SMB security stack. So you know our our, our different offerings, we try to fit them into one of those and 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 uh, sell them the entire solution, not just bits and pieces, and say, okay, yeah, you can use my RMM tool because you're not going to make any money using the RMM tool. Um, you you know having a, a progression where they can escalate things to you easily, I think, is important which we can do through, through you know, PSA that we're using, which in, in our case is Datto. But, um, and, and then we have, we have a training um, um, university wrapped in this stuff. And so we try to, you know, we try to spread it uh, and give them the same value we'd give an SMB client. It's just, it's just leading a horse to water because uh, you know, every uh, small IT department you deal with is gonna, you know, the dynamic is gonna be, well, who are they? You know, and if it's a guy that's been there for 30 years, you know, and, 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 you know, doesn't eat healthy, <laughs> you know, might drop dead any day. He's probably not going to really care about adopting all these new things. He's going to care about the way he's done things for the last 30 years. And, and, and that has been my experience. Um, well, you can they, see you as a threat, right? I mean, that, that seems the obvious piece of resistance to me. You know, I guess I used to think that I, I don't think as much anymore. I just don't think that they're that energetic and don't, don't really, I mean, if you're an MSP and you're not constantly drinking from, from the fire hose and learning new things and you better keep in touch with security. I did a thing on MFA yesterday and, 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 and all the, the flaws and vulnerabilities in MFA. If you're not doing all that kind of stuff, you're just coming to work and, you know, replacing a couple of PCs and installing a server every six years, then, you know, you're, you're not going to be up to speed. So yeah. Yeah, that, that that's a big deal. And, and then you have to be able to communicate with each one of those people. And, you know, as we know, people are diverse, you know, they all have different behaviors and, and, and work ethic and all that kind of stuff. And you do the co-managed IT, they're not your employee. You know? And different Hawaiian shirts too. None, none with that color. <laughs> you know, Matt, we, if, we, if we take a break, I can go put a, a pink one on. <laughs> 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 like costume change. <laughs> it's not a bad idea, actually. Well, you know, because <laughs> we do take breaks on this show. <laughs> yes, we do. So Rich, anything else here in this uh, beachhead story that we want to talk about? Uh, I don't. I, I, the, I guess my last quick little thought, that, you know, just following up on something you were asking about there is. Um, so he, he, this is an instance in which a vendor has modified a contract to accommodate co-managed IT. Off the top of my head, I can't think of situations yet where vendors have actually changed a system so that it's easier to, to use in, in that kind of a situation, but I'm waiting to see it. I, I have a hunch, you know, that somewhere in development right now, um, it is a product that uh, is being um, tailored specifically to that use case. Um, and it, it, we'll see, you know, if, if I'm right and what, what's different about it uh, in, in, the, in that situation. Very cool. All right. Well, there's, there is some more, uh, more quotes and some other information here in the story. So if you're listening uh, on the go right now, you can go to channel4network.com, find the show sheet for episode 161. And there we put links to all the stories uh, that we're talking about. So you can go and you can get all the extra details because we're just kind of 
scratching the surface on some of the details and talking about the bigger concepts uh, that they bring up. Uh, if you're watching along on YouTube, hello, you can see me wave, uh, go into the description area, uh, drop that down, and then we'll, you'll have all the links there to these stories as well. So you can kind of read along uh, as, you, as you watch. All right, our next story is, gonna, is about ConnectWise. Uh, they have uh, they've introduced a bounty program. Uh, are, they, are, are they now hiring the Mandalorian, Rich? <laughs> uh, not yet, but uh, you know, that, that, that could be an option. Um, uh, it's probably something that uh, a lot of vendors would do if, uh, if it was a possibility. Um, so yeah, what we're talking about here is a bug bounty program actually that ConnectWise has uh, officially introduced this week. It's actually been in effect for uh, a few weeks now, but they kind of had the, uh, the, the coming out party for you, if, it will, if you will, this week. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I think we are all aware at this point um, the degree to which uh, MSPs uh, are, are being targeted by hackers these days. And uh, the hackers understand if I can get into the RMM system, then now I've got credentials, you know, or PSA, remote access. Now I have access to lots of, uh, of customers instead of just having to break into them uh, one at a time. So it's been a lot of threat activity directed um, at companies like ConnectWise. ConnectWise has, in fact, you know, had run into some issues, um, uh, as have uh, uh, other companies in terms of uh, weaknesses in their products being uh, exploited. And so this, this year, they have put a real emphasis on a number of different measures uh, that have been aimed at um, enhancing the security of uh, their software. And they, they you know, on a big picture level, they call all these things their shift left uh, initiative. And the idea is to push security first thinking earlier into the product development price process. And so th there's threat modeling that they do when a product is being designed. They've got these um, to tools that they use during the actual coding process that will flag potential vulnerabilities, literally as a programmer is potentially creating one. Uh, you'll get a little alert that asks if this is really a good idea or not. Um, there's all sorts of internal testing that they do. So there, there, there's all sorts of stuff that they've been um, introducing over the course of the year uh, to get you know even more serious about security with respect to their products, this is one of the last little pieces in that that shift left program that, uh, that they've actually uh, rolled out. And in this case, what you're doing is taking a product you know after it's been developed, after it's been shipped, uh, and sort of handing it on over um, to a community of white hat hackers and saying, "Have at it." Um, see, see what you can find in here uh, that uh, somebody with a black hat on their head might uh, take advantage of in a, in a nefarious way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've heard of bug bounty programs before. Honestly, I didn't know very much about how they work. Um, the way the ConnectWise program works, they, they are doing this in partnership with a company called HackerOne. And HackerOne is a, a security services provider, but I mean, really the, the product that they sell is this community of, of hackers that they represent. And if you want penetration performed by a community of you know, professional hackers, they can do that for you. If you want um, people to, to search your software for uh, bugs, they can do that as well. And so through the HackerOne platform, um, uh, HackerOne has uh, created sort of an uh, invitation list. They don't open this up apparently to all their members, but they'll look for people with appropriate skills and, and uh, a record of, uh, of good results. And they'll invite those people to participate in the ConnectWise bug bounty program. And every time they find a, a bug, um, they, get, uh, they make some money, they get paid. Um, the amount varies. It, it depends a little bit on the severity of the issue that they found. If you find a, a good, solid, scary bug, uh, you might make a few thousand dollars for that, apparently. Um, over time, those, those uh, numbers will shift um, because uh, you can, you know, like any other marketplace, the HackerOne platform uh, is a marketplace and there's supply and demand and the people who are paying better are going to attract the attention of the, you know, more skilled hackers and so on. But um, uh, there are apparently people in the world who make all or some of their living doing this kind of stuff and ConnectWise is now kind of turning them into an extended member of their security team, essentially. Uh, you know, to, to help them uh, lock down uh, uh, potential problems in their software. And it's, you know, it's, it's another sign of the times, uh, essentially, because uh, most of the, the big vendors who are by their own admission being targeted uh, a lot and, and uh, even more than usual these days are investing more seriously in uh, these kinds of security measures. It makes me think, Rich, is there really such a thing as a white hat hacker? 
or are they all actually gray hat hackers where like on one side on Tuesdays, they're getting paid for helping find bugs and software. And then on Wednesday, they put the black hat on and they go and they're exploiting other, other things. Are they, are they, are they double dipping? I'm thinking there might be some bipolar hackers out there and then you'd really don't know what you're dealing with. <laughs> right. Like, well, it seems, it seems like, it, you know, if you're exposing your software to be hacked, what stops the hacker from finding the bug to turn around right away and try to exploit that uh, if it's already something that's deployed? You know, it's, it's a fascinating question. And what it calls to mind, I know that in, uh, on the dark web, if you are a hacker trying to kind of break your way into some corner of that where people are sharing tips and, and stolen property and so on and so forth, um, typically, as I understand it, you have to kind of prove that you're a criminal. Like you, you have to prove that you're a black hat somehow to them because otherwise they're afraid you might be an investigator or something like that. I, and I don't know how you do that, um, but there are ways, you know, that, um, that you can establish, no, really, I'm, I'm a criminal just like you. And I, I wonder how it works on the other side, you know, if, if you're Hacker One and you have, Hacker One does business with Fortune 500 companies, Hacker One um, uh, does business with the U, you know, US Department of Defense. The people who are pretty sensitive about who they're admitting into, uh, into their software. Uh, and so I, I don't know, but I wonder how a, a, an organization like Hacker One, you know, verifies <laughs> that the only hat you have is white. I thought it was just the guys wear hoodies and that pretty much qualified them. <laughs> go back and the yes, uh, that's what marketing says. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we must all go back and uh, refer to episode 158, the hoodie index, uh, for more <laughs> for more on uh, the hoodies that hackers and the nefarious wear. Because uh, Rich, who who was who was on that show? That was uh, that was Rory Sanchez, and we were know, talking right. about. Um, how we, we could help, we could find hackers by tracking sales of hoodies. Right, right. <laughs> Tra tracing those. Yeah, that's what we need to do. <laughs> uh, very cool. So this is, um, I mean, anytime that we, we see these programs, uh, I, I'm kind of bummed they didn't name it like, you know, the Mandalorian, I see it like the Mandalorian pro project or something like that. But uh, I mean, a lot of companies do this what 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 are they hoping other than to you know maybe get a little bit stronger security foothold what where to where does this something that they're going to do ongoing or is this they're doing this for a period of time because they might, might have issues right now what what is what is the the end of this so this is ongoing um you know indefinite they they have no plans to uh to cancel it there is uh, i should say an expectation and i guess this is just typically how it works with bug bounty programs you know you you announce to uh say you know the the hacker base behind hacker one you tell them hey we've got a new customer and here's their software and people dive right in because uh, they know there there's like you know low hanging fruit uh, essentially, and so there, there's some quick bucks to be made. And then after a while, the low hanging fruit's gone. You've got to work a little bit harder to to find new vulnerabilities and so on. So there is some expectation that they're going to see a lot of activity in the short run, and then maybe it'll tail off a little bit uh, over time. But they're they're going to keep doing this. Um, and you know, and the thinking basically is um, first of all. Uh, Another set of eyes on the code is 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 probably always a good thing. Um, so you know they they're doing plenty of work in house to find and eliminate vulnerabilities. And I assume you know people uh, partners and and uh, customers now and again are reporting issues if they come across something or other. Uh, but to have have somebody else contributing as well um, is is uh, a good thing. And in in this case, the people who are doing the contributing are very similar to the people who would be doing the attacking. And so there's, you know, there, there's a logic there to uh, 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 partnering with somebody who has that mindset, the hacker mindset, and, and just see what they find. And apparently, you know, like I said, this has been uh, in effect, the, the uh, bug bounty program has been running for a few weeks now. They just announced it this week. And, they, you know, uh, a few bugs have already been reported. Now, Eric, is it important to, for you as, a, as someone who chooses these tools, when you see something like, oh, I see they do a bug bounty program, did, does that sway you in any way? Like, oh. I, that, I like that they are being, you know, conscious about security and uh, strengthening their, their, their product. Or, or is that something like, yeah, they all do that. I mean, it's not, it doesn't weigh in to your decision-making process. 
I don't think that weighs into my decision making process. I mean, and going back to the Mandalorian thing, I, I think of Back to the Future when you say that. So I kind of get like mixed up here on the <laughs> Star Wars versus, you know, whatever. I think side side issue there. Well, uh, that's the DeLorean, not the Mandalorian. <laughs> yeah, well, there was a man in the DeLorean, though. There was a man, oh, the man in the DeLorean. The manned, <laughs> the manned DeLorean. All right, we're going to lose people if we continue down this track, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't, I don't sway me either way. It's something they should be doing regardless. And if they don't advertise this program, there's people out there that are going to do it regardless. I doubt that they're providing source code to these people anyways. You know, I think I would say that here's our, you know, here's the application, hack it. Uh, and who's not going to do that now, right? Right. Right, for sure. And you know, it's really funny for, for those who get one of the little bit of behind the scenes here, as we go through the show, Rich and I will pick out things for potential show titles because everybody knows our show titles are, uh, you know, they're always kind of fun and um, re reference something we said. It was literally at the exact same moment that on my screen, as I typed mine, Rich typed in the exact same show title as a, as a possibility. So Rich, I think I know what the show title is going to be. <laughs> we'll just uh, we'll just have to wait and see if Eric agrees. All right. Uh, very good stuff. Um, uh, Rich, anything else to talk about here, or any other thoughts we want to get, uh, specifically from uh, from Eric's point of view? Uh, I think we're good. I think we're good on this. I think we're good. Good. And there is there's a lot of links here. I'm not really sure why they call it the Shift Left Security Initiative. It would be more like shifting down. I guess wouldn't it be down in the development process. Start from the bottom. Work your way up. I believe they're thinking in terms of like timeline, which typically goes left to right. I think. Not, not when you have a, de a manned DeLorean, the time can go any direction <laughs> then. So now we're messing up their whole model here. So we gotta be careful how, uh, how, how, how much more difficult we make it for them. So uh, very good. Uh, we'll put this uh, link to the story here in the show notes uh, for those who wanna dive a little bit more into some of the more nitty gritty on this one. Uh, but that's it for news this week. Uh, but we do have a couple other stories that we're going to talk about. One is about uh, work from home security, how to make work from home security work. Rich, what's, what's up with this? So, uh, and, and, you know, before I answer that question, I'm just going to go uh, straight to a shameless plug, uh, Matt, because, uh, you know, we here at uh, Channel Pro, we do uh, conferences uh, in addition to publish a website and a magazine and all the other uh, podcasts, all the other great things that we do. Uh, and so the, the content for this article we're talking about, um, which is about work from home security, appeared in a recent issue of the magazine. All of that is actually based on input that we got at one of our events from a panel uh, of, of partners who deliver security services. And you know they, they were talking to us about how they have been dealing with work from home security this year. Uh, and, and I will quickly point out that uh, Eric this year has been a, a regular, um, highly valuable member of a different panel on, uh, that we've been doing about cloud computing. So he knows how that, uh, that whole kind of thing goes. But we, we've been doing these um, uh, sort of coronavirus age security panels uh, this year that have been really uh, interesting conversations. And we collected some of the, uh, the best practices, the tips from those panelists into an article that we put in the magazine not long ago. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, I guess you could kind of sort it out very quickly um, this way. So, I mean, at, at a minimum, um, you, you've got to be doing the absolute basics with, uh, with every endpoint out there at a work from home client's home. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes that's a, a corporate device. Sometimes it's a personal device. Sometimes it's a device that... Uh, uh, a, uh, an employee is sharing with the rest of the family. And in fact, at, at the beginning of the article, I, uh, I share an anecdote in there from, uh, from one of the panelists uh, about the very first uh, work from home endpoint that he had to think about from a security standpoint. And uh, it belonged to the CEO of, of one of the companies that he represented. It was like 14 years old. Um, you know, his kids were playing games on it. It, it, uh, it was connected to a home network that didn't even have WPA enabled. It was totally open to the world. There's a lot of that going on uh, out there right now. And um, you've just got to get endpoint security software and DNS filtering um, on those products and, and or uh, those systems. And that shouldn't be um, uh, all that hard. Now, if your customers are remoting into um, uh, systems back at the home office, 
um, then you're going to, uh, you know, VPN obviously becomes a must. And most of the uh, channel pros I've spoken with in the last six months are, have been using um, a VPN for that purpose. Um, a lot of times they're using VPN specifically because they have customers who uh, rely on Microsoft's RDP or, or RDS technology to remote into uh, 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 corporate resources. And uh, RDP, RDS, uh, notoriously insecure, um, depending on how you do it, if, if you're not careful about it. And uh, in fact, there are statistics from various security researchers showing a massive uh, increase round in that uh, March, April timeframe from hackers, you know, looking for exposed uh, RDS uh, and RDP connections. Um, so v VPN to secure those connections is a, a you know, reasonably valid uh, way to protect them. But we've spoken on, uh, on these panel discussions with people who are also using these kind of proxied uh, RDP solutions where you're, you're sort of directing traffic to a, a, a cloud site where it gets cleaned and filtered and so on, and then it goes through from that secure environment into the, the customer's environment. Uh, there's a, in particular a system from a company called TrueGrid, T-R-U-G-R-I-D, that um, uh, Joshua Liverman, one of the panelists, is, has been using with some success. Um, so, I mean, you, you need a layered security strategy. You need to do all that stuff you need to do. Uh, MFA, which you were just kind of talking about before, uh, Eric, R Rory Sanchez, whose name was invoked a little bit earlier on, says that from his point of view, almost every successful phishing attack can be foiled with MFA. Um, so, you, you, you know, it, it, and it's a pain in the neck to use, and there are end users who will object to it for that reason, but you really kind of need to convince them to start using it. And then over time, you know, you, you can think about um, sort of the, the follow-on uh, revenue opportunities, which are also much needed services for your customers. So security awareness training is something that people have been doing more about this year. Once the, the right technologies are in place, by all means, get some training uh, going out there. And then um, I was talking uh, just within the last uh, few weeks with a, a partner who said that he could probably have a full-time employee at his company doing nothing but write security policies um, for his customer because this has turned into um, a really important uh, business. I mean, and it's one that um, is, is producing revenue for him, but it's also helping him protect these companies to just get a written security policy about what you, you as an employee can, can't do, should, shouldn't do um, when working from home, you know, on the go, working at the office. Um, a lot of SMBs do not have that kind of security policy in place. They need help creating it. And so there are opportunities like that, and, you know, drafting incident response plans. Um, so uh, anyway, all, all sorts of, uh, you know, advice from our experts who we had on the panel and, and have continued to have on the, the panels uh, this year from uh, some techniques that you can use to keep those work from home clients who, let's face it, are going to be working from home at least part time for some while to come. Uh, a little bit safer. We, we could probably spend four shows just on work from home security and, and that. So Eric, I want to turn it over to you a little bit. Um, I, I don't know if you got a chance to read through a lot of what they're talking about here, but I know that as someone who I'm sure is dealing right now with a lot of work from home uh, clients who maybe traditionally didn't do a lot of work from home, but now are you, what are the challenges you're seeing with securing these, these types of people? What is, what do you look for first? Um, do you look for, you know, RDP stuff that, uh, that, that's being used that is, that's insecure? Are you looking for, for just antivirus and anti-malware uh, software and securing those that way? Where do you start? Well, the, to Rich's point, um, I forget what that was. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Um, it, that's right, he doesn't to, remember either. To, to, <laughs> Rich's, to Rich's point, layered security obviously is, is a thing, okay? And, and having multiple road, you know, stops and blocking uh, is, is it crucial. Uh, and I think everybody in the industry would agree with that. Um, MFA is not perfect. MFA can be hacked. Uh, if you've not watched Kevin Min uh, Mitnick's uh, little 45 minute deal, I would strongly suggest that any MSP or anybody in the IT business go look at that because it's not secure. Uh, SMS based and, and, and SIM, um, SIM cards and things like that can be foiled. So don't think that just because you have MFA on you're, you're protected. Uh, desktop endpoint uh, management even, so we do a lot of virtual desktops, but that's the way we secure corporate data. 
um, and, and being so cloud centric, we had already migrated many, many, many clients into SharePoint. So as far as flat file access things, you know, like documents and, 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 and spreadsheets and things like that, uh, we had already migrated those to cloud. So I think we had a leg up uh, in, a, in a lot of ways line of business applications, the older stuff, and certain workflows that they have that they required. Um, we would typically build a VPN back to on-site and still secure them with Windows Virtual Desktop. And then we found a lot of people didn't like that because they were kind of locked down and they started taking their their uh, endpoints, their, their PCs, laptops home, you know, just moving and lifting and shifting the entire PC to the house. We already had those computers protected. Uh, and we do, obviously, we're going to do antivirus on those machines, but we're going to we go a step further than that. And we put some um, some some um, SIM receptors or, or essentially, you know, a piece of anal um, a piece of agent software that analyzes what that system's doing, where it's reaching out to, what kind of protocols are coming out of it, and reports that back into a central console. So we can get an idea, you know, at least uh, what the endpoints are doing now that they're all out there and scattered. And, uh, and, 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 you know, essentially that's, that's part of our, um, our security framework to begin with. So it was already in place. I think that the, in, in retrospect, going back to the beginning of the year, when March, March, April, when this started all happening was the logistics of getting people out of the office in, in, into their homes with, um, poor networks, crappy Wi-Fi. You know, everybody thinks their Wi-Fi is great until they actually try to use it for something productive. And we made a number of home visits, did quite a few different things uh, to, to facilitate that. Um, but, you know, from a security perspective, we told our clients that we can't protect your networks unless it's a corporate owned device or we have absolute control over the system that the employee wants to use from home, uh, which means that we lock it down. We follow the same protocols that we do, least user permissions. They can't install software. They can't do this. They can't do that. Plus, the PC had to be clean to begin with. And that was a whole nother challenge. But we didn't have a lot of that. We only had a few of uh, a few of those because we had already set those policies in place. And back to you, Rich, um, we are working actively on on continuity planning. So we have a system that allows us to send text alerts to clients and and to actually uh, pre-plan these kind of events. Now we didn't have a COVID plan because nobody really knew. A, you know about this but uh our florida market hurricanes regular issue uh, back in dallas uh, oklahoma tornadoes then pop you know one night you might have a catastrophic tornado come through and without proper planning you don't even know how to notify your end users do they come into the office is the office gone um you know is their power on can you do a wellness check of your end users to know that hey they made it through that storm okay and they're coming back to work the next day should they come back to work and all those kind of things. So there are some applications out there uh, in the MSP space available to do that. And, um, and, and they're progressing pretty quickly. And we've got a hell, hell of a marketing opportunity. I mean, obviously, um, you know, in spite of the, the pandemic, because uh, negative effects, it's certainly enlightened a lot of people that they better get their crap together. Yeah, and I mean, um, it's one of those um, business opportunities I've really been interested in for, I mean, probably the last 12 months or so. I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, products and platforms that can enable uh, this there. I know of one in particular that I've uh, written about before, probably talked about on the show before called um, Plan for Continuity. Uh, by a Canadian company called Cloud Oak. Um, and it's just really about helping an MSP draft uh, a, a continuity plan or a, 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 an incident response plan for an end user and then actually execute it if you have, need to put it into effect. And there really is a whole business around that, um, uh, basically. And, and I, I think you're, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, anyone who is skeptical, anyone from, from the uh, end user world who is skeptical about the wisdom of investing in, in business continuity planning before, hopefully understands now um, that it, it is useful to have thought ahead. You, you can't necessarily anticipate a pandemic but you can't anticipate a hurricane in, in, in Florida, an earthquake in Southern California. You know, you, you know that, um, unfortunately, you know, fire or God forbid, a, 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 an active shooter incident could happen. You know, there are some things that you can anticipate could happen. Uh, and as we all have kind of discovered the hard way this year, it, it's better to have thought ahead uh, about uh, some of the stuff and know what to do. And, uh, and that's something that, uh, uh, a channel pro can do with and, and for a customer um, that, that they need done and, and should be willing to pay for. Yeah. And, and Troy, if you hear this uh, podcast, we're expecting a little something extra in our mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> that would be Troy from Cloudo. <laughs> he just made his day. 
<laughs> that we did. So Eric, uh, last thing on this. So I, I love the little anecdote, anecdote that's the beginning of this because it seems like every time I'm asked to work on an older computer, and, and, I, and it's not like I do it a lot um, from a professional standpoint these days, but, but you know, as, as I'm sure you are, Eric, to a lot of friends and family, you're like the go-to guy for all kinds of IT things. Why is it that every time you get an old computer to work on, it has like a copy of McAfee that has been out of date for six years? Because they, they had administrative privileges and they could stall anything they wanted to. So <laughs> that's, pretty much, that's pretty much the answer there. That's what I always find. It's like, it's like, it's like oh, I have an antivirus security, but like, yeah, but it hasn't been updated in seven years, right? And, like it, and a 14-year-old computer, who's playing games on that, Rich? That's like, that's old. <laughs> that's kind of, when was that? What kind of computer was that? What was that? What kind of computer would be, four, who had owned a computer for 14 years? Yeah, well, and again, this is the CEO of a reasonably good-sized company. I mean, the, the, he, he wasn't hurting for cash, right? Like this, this guy could afford a new PC, but, uh, you yeah, know, this thing kept chugging along for 14 years, so what the heck? Yeah, you know, my perspective be... on that is that thing sits in a room, and it's just never been replaced because nobody uses it any longer, and most executives don't sit behind a PC. They're consuming all their stuff on, on some kind of smart device anymore. You know, so they don't go back to the PC and log in and do all that kind of stuff. They pretty much, you know, they got an iPad, they got an iPhone, or they got a, a, a Droid tablet or whatever it might happen to be. So I just don't see them using them much any longer. Yeah, I was so 14 years ago today, that would have been 1990, no, not today, 2006. So I'm trying to think of the kinds of computers that were around in 2006. <laughs> I was there. They were pretty advanced compared to when I started in this industry. So <laughs> yes. That's pretty sad. <laughs> that's true. I'm, I'm going for our museum pick later today. I'm, we're going to come back and touch on like what. It might be me. What, what, <laughs> what computers, what a computer was like in 2006. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll we're, we're going to come back to this. It's interesting. Now, Rich, I, I got to say that this work from home security story I mean, it flows right into the next story, which, which is like, duh, we saw this coming, right? As you send work PCs home, well, obviously riskier things are going to be done on those work PCs as, as the personal and professional kind of get more blended together. So, Rich, what are we, what are we seeing in trends on uh, things people are doing on work PCs? Yeah, you know, I should have worked this, uh, this story into that prior or almost use it as a uh, setup to the work from home security conversation we just had. But th this is an article that uh, showed up in uh, the most recent issue of the magazine. It's up on our website now as well. We'll obviously link to it from the show sheet. And it's just um, a, uh, a summary of some data, some uh, interesting um, security data from a security vendor named Netscope uh, about the whole remote work um, situation and what they're seeing out there, what users are doing. Um, and, uh, you know, so, personal use of managed devices. So uh, to your point, Matt, you know, um, you can send a, uh, a person home with a corporate device. And so maybe they have a home PC and a business PC, but are they going to use both of those or are they going to kind of pick one and do everything there? Um, so what Netscope has reported is a 97% increase of people using a, a managed device, which is presumably a business device for personal purposes. And God knows uh, what that is, except that there is a statistic to suggest what, in some cases at least, uh, these people are doing from a personal nature on their business device. There has been a 600% increase in visits to adult content on managed devices since the beginning of, uh, of COVID-19. Um, uh, let's see, um, percentage of people who are uploading files uh, that are images, images that could contain, um, you know, sensitive information aren't maybe being um, scanned thoroughly. That's up 14%. Um, use of risky apps and websites, according to Netsca uh, Netscope, on work from home hardware, up 161% based on their, uh, their metrics. Um, and I don't know if this is good news or bad news, you know, um, users who intentionally uploaded sensitive data to a personal uh, cloud app, like, you know, Dropbox or something like that, um, they are saying 7% of the users in their survey base have done that, intentionally taken something um, from a secure platform, loaded it up into their personal box or Dropbox somewhere. 7%, hey, it's a single digit number. Maybe that's good news. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, 
all sorts of very interesting um, uh, statistics in this Netscope study that only go to underscore uh, the fact that uh, pretty much everything you fear might be happening out there in these home environments probably is. Yes, Eric, um, how many times have you told people who, who have a work computer to never do anything personal on it because work, work, they know everything you do on your computer. I mean, it's like, don't do this kind of stuff, but it never seems to matter. Well, you know, curiously enough, it doesn't for some of them. I mean, uh, so, so we are using some, uh, some third party solutions, uh, a third party solution. I won't mention it unless you tell me it's okay to mention it, but uh, it. that allows us. Okay. Well, so we're using active track. Um, allows us to to kind of set guidelines and 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 not really just monitor what's happening on a computer, but it can be during business hours, outside of business hours. I interestingly enough had one employee. Uh, she's probably going to listen to this, so I'm going to catch hell. But uh, I spent seven hours of Victoria's Secret. I, I don't know how much crap you can buy in one hour in Victoria's Secret, but I have to believe that you know that's a lot of window shopping. It was probably outside of business hours. I hadn't set policies, but we uh, we do deploy that. That's uh, in part of our stack, so so employee productivity monitoring, and the clients that we're working with are gamifying it and and letting their employees resources know, and then we ignore all the bad stuff outside of business hours, you know, because because they're I mean obviously clearly um, com compromising or personal things happening on systems if they're using them personally and they don't have another computer sitting next to it that they they compartmentalize and do all their personal stuff and then they hop over here and they do all the work stuff i, I that i you know if that happens it's probably um, much uh, less than than you know them just using the pc for whatever the hell they want to do once they know that it's being tracked because you know if you think about it in an, in an average environment nobody's micromanaging everything that an employee's doing uh, nor does anybody want to do that, you know, but, but they do want to know the employee is productive. And so those systems that are out there can be, um, can be um, refined to really fit and, and help with continuous improvement of the employees uh, and, and for them to get potentially benefits out of it or, or rewards or things along those lines, um, as opposed to something negative. But uh, I've seen some wacky stuff. Yeah, I've seen people sign in at nine o'clock in the morning and then leave until noon and you know stuff like that so good yeah you know it, it's really interesting you bring that up because one of the things um that i've heard from and and i won't say it's like you know dozens but i i've had a few conversations with um msps who have said that um since work from home began um some uh at least of their customers have have come to them and asked is is there software can you give me something that will help me see what my employees are doing at home because I, you know, I, I think almost universally, everybody kind of agrees that even employers who refuse to allow people to work from home uh, have discovered that it's, it, it actually works pretty well. And that's why we expect work from home to be part of the IT landscape more or less forever uh, at this point. Um, but the, it, it almost feels like there was this you know, next reaction. The initial reaction was, oh, okay, this is actually not so bad after all, and I can maybe save some money on commercial real estate. And then the second response was basically, but you know what, I can't see what they're doing. I wonder what they're doing. And, um, and so businesses were, you know, it sounds like have been starting to reach out to MSPs and kind of asking for help. Can you help me track what my people are doing during the workday? I mean, have, have you encountered that too? Is that why you're using ActiveTrack because you needed to find something or was this something you'd been doing already? Uh, no, it, this is relatively new. We had done a different solution that was much more intrusive in the past. This, this particular app seems to be more in line to give you an overview and an idea of what's happening in your workforce, regardless of whether they're in the office or outside the office. And back to that first point on the remote worker thing, you know, I think you can break people up into probably three or four different personality types. And I see this all the time and I'm, I'm not on the help desk or anything like that, but I do communicate with end users from time to time. And I, I, you know, we see conversations and things like that. Many of them want to come back into an office. They do not want to continue to work from home because it's a, it's, it's a social work kind of thing that they need. Uh, so yeah, I think there's obviously there's an immediate um, effect to commercial real estate there probably is going to be some percentage of a long-term effect, but um, I, I think people are going to come back and do an office at some point. I mean, it, it's, I'm not, I don't want any politics in this, but it's a flu. 
Okay, you know, it's a very contagious flu that's bad that will go away and then something else is going to come along in the future and then something else will come along in another 10 years or whatever it happens to be. So I think as a, as, you know, as a pop or as a, as a, as a, a humans, we need to be prepared for that. I don't want to compartmentalize that into a particular country. I think, you know, worldwide, we need to prepare for that. There are going to be pandemics. There's going to be things. So back to the planning thing and having alternative plans to, to be able to work. But, um, I think people want to, they want to be together. Um, I'm fine working alone. <laughs> I don't need anybody. I got to do the dog and me. We're fine. But uh, there's a lot of people that don't function that way and can't perform that way. And we see that through these applications and we see that in productivity. They're easily distracted. They're, um, you know, they're using and, and, you know, they're Facebooking all day long when they should be, you know, doing something else. They were doing that be before anyways. They were doing that on their smartphones you know, inside the office. So because this is not a new problem. It's just probably something that brought it more to, to, to more attention to executive management than maybe it had been in the past. And so, so that, that leads into the next uh, discussion that we're going to talk to with you about is just about, you know, just your, how, uh, how the coronavirus and it's, uh, it, it, this pandemic, how, how it's affected TerraCloud much more specifically and kind of where you see that kind of going down the road. So talk, talk a little bit about how it's just, change TerraCloud, at least in the, in the near term, you say that people might go back, people might, might go back. How much of your workforce is now distributed and working from home? Tell us a little about that. Yeah, so we were already virtual. Um, so you know, nobody comes into an office. I'm actually, you know, we, we we're building a couple offices out next door in, uh, in the residence here to bring people in so we can get some of that camaraderie and, and that, that, that togetherness from time to time. It's harder though, being in multiple locations in multiple states because we got people spread out so much. Uh, so, you know, we utilize teams, we, we do all those kind of things and, and, and try to, you know, to, to get together frequently. Actually, we get together pretty much every day. Um, so it hasn't been a huge challenge for us from that perspective. I think uh, from a business perspective, it's been more of a challenge. We haven't really lost any clients. Um, we lost one intentionally that was on the, the, the edge anyways. Um, but we haven't gained a lot of clients. And, and so we've shift, shifted our marketing focus. We've kind of doubled down on marketing. Uh, are in the process of revamping website messaging, and we've just finished rebundling all our packages together. So we have continuity. We sell a single product. We don't pick and choose. You know, we don't pick and choose and, and attempt to become commodities. And we're bundling a lot of IP around other solutions. So we spent a lot of time doing that. But what I haven't put in, uh, what we we haven't done is gotten a lot of net new business. So we've recently, uh, we brought another salesperson on in the Texas market. Uh, we've got a full-time marketing person that, that is doing a lot of stuff internally. We've got a calendar with, with events and things like that right now. They're virtual and, and just marketing related events, but we hope to put some on, you know, some on-site stuff in the near future together. But that's the biggest um, negative, I think, is the slowdown in finding new business. How do you find that new business now? Um, and, and we, I'm sorry, you know, we, it's not like we haven't added anything. We have added some, some new business. We've, we've upsold some customers and things like that, but you know, we're not meeting our 30, 35% growth, pro, you know, um, prediction that we thought we would be at pre COVID. And so that's been a little disappointing because we, I keep investing back in the company and spending money on resources and people. And at some point we have to receive a return on that. So, and that's kind of where we are right now. So, I mean, are, are you seeing, you know, it, it, we were talking about um, security and, and uh, security around work from home has been this, this uh, constant uh, topic of conversation, but cloud computing has been the other big um, uh, technological tie-in to work from home and, uh, and certainly by reputation, the idea out there um, is that businesses that were maybe kind of, you know, drifting slowly in the direction of getting everything into the cloud are moving there faster now, now that they kind of understand the advantages of being able to access your stuff anywhere, anytime, etc. So, I mean, are, are you seeing more um, receptiveness to, you know, workload migration, more adoption of certain cloud platform. You mentioned virtual desktops before, you know, within your existing customer base, are you seeing more of a movement faster um, toward cloud technologies? Yes. I mean, as fast as we can do it. Um, so, you know, these small, especially in the small scale, you know, in the, the five, 10 user offices, and, and we've already brought them onto Microsoft 365. So, you know, the tools are already there. And now it's about policies and best practices and implementing SharePoint and, and teaching them teams. It's, I think it's more of a knowledge gap. Uh, they're a little lost of where to start. 
uh, and, and, and we have invested a lot in expertise of our people. To, again, we use these tools every day. Uh, you know, we, and we combine from a security perspective where we want to manage and monitor that data. We don't want data loss. We don't want somebody uploading something to Box or, or, or Dropbox or anything along those lines. We were going to monitor for, for sensitive data and alert when that happens. And we're going to auto encrypt and we're going to do all those things. And those are part of our bundles. Um, I think the hardest part is getting in front of somebody long enough to explain to them, oh, excuse me, that they need that. Okay. All the three CX resellers know we use three CX now. Anyways, um, but but you know, so it's, it's getting that audience and in, in front of the people and go back going back to the same dynamic of you know we're we're not meeting with a lot of clients uh, in person any longer, and that that's a big dynamic because I'm used to doing that. I'm used to going out and visiting and taking them out to lunch and doing all that type of stuff. Now it's pretty much all virtual. So you know, I've shifted my time to spend an hour a week with our key customers. Uh, and we work on, on business solutions. We work on, okay, let's set some initiatives up. Let's go into, and, we, and we're driving this all through Teams. We're a Microsoft shop, um, and we're driving through Teams. We're using, uh, you know, Planner to create tasks and goals for them in, internally in their organization. So we'll create an account on, on their platform, and I will work, or our people will work in that platform to help build some of those solutions. So we might do a, you know, power automate, I like to call it flow, but we might do a, you know, a workflow or something every week, something to, 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 to you know, just to gain a little bit of ground as opposed to, you know, driving to somewhere and meeting with, with people. And that's, they've been receptive for that. So that's kept our churn. I don't know if that's kept our churn low or zero, but, um, you know, they, they're very receptive to that kind of thing. So, you know, if somebody's not doing that type of stuff right now, I, I know everybody wants to monetize everything, but hell, you were going to go out and have lunch with them. You save the lunch money, you spend a half hour, 45 minutes with them on, you know, on a topic that benefits them. And uh, that's probably just as good. I forget where we were going with this. I was kind of drifting on you guys again. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no problem at all. I mean, um, so in terms of you know uh, the the substance of those conversations that you're having with those customers, uh, and I know that the the answer to this is going to vary company to company, but um, is there a, a, a something of a generalized roadmap for where you see almost where you want your customers to go? You know, um, now I'm like looking ahead. We've been talking a lot about what's happened in the last six months. Now let's kind of think you know six, twelve, eighteen months ahead from where we are now. Um, you, you've pretty much universally got everybody, it sounds like, on Microsoft 365. Um, are, are there other technologies, uh, other cloud solutions that you, you envision as, as something that most of your customers should uh, adopt? And uh, should we ask your colleague there? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> She's disappearing in and out. Say hi, Rich. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we've got kind of like a very general roadmap. Uh, very general roadmap uh, of uh, technology adoption. And, and, and the core for us starts with Teams because Teams brings everything together in a hub. Uh, it could easily be Slack or some other third party, you know, if you're a Google shop or whatever it might happen to be, you, you know, I think it just, you know, you need to have that vision of, of you know, of, of um, enhancing and bettering what, what the client's day-to-day -day operations look like. Because, you know, I mean, this industry shifts every, you know, well, it used to shift every 10, 15 years. Now it seems like every two or three years there's something new going on and it's IOT or it's, you know, something else. But um, we have a roadmap. What we've been doing is bundling uh, small projects into a little solution set just to, okay, you know, we want to implement Microsoft 365. MFA, we want to harden the environment. There's that, that, that's a little project. And if the customer hadn't already had that done, there it is. And we can do that with flows that, and, you know, with, with automate and some of the other tools inside and that, that, that technology stack, uh, regardless whether it's Microsoft or, or anybody's. So, you know, the roadmap is to drive adoption through teams because people seem to be extremely receptive to that. And we've got the backing of Microsoft and their marketing dollars behind that as well. And then content is content's never an issue. We always have plenty of content to drive those things forward. And then we go, you know, a few steps beyond that and try to speak directly to the end users to help them get on board because typically the, you know, the, the decision maker, you know, that, that uh, COO, CIO, owner, whatever it happens to be, doesn't have the bandwidth to coordinate all that other stuff. And so the, the good clients are receptive to that and, and letting us speak directly to the end users as long as we've got a vision behind it. 
Well, very cool. Well, we need to move on uh, to our next uh, segment here. So what we're going to do, and Eric, thanks for sharing all that. Um, really, really interesting stuff. And um, it'll be interesting to see how, uh, how your business and, and how your clients' businesses uh, adapt uh, to, to all of this pandemic, to pandemic and change as, uh, as we move forward from here. So we do want to take a break. When we come back, we've got an interview uh, for you this week. Now, Rich, uh, this is an interview with Tim Fitzgerald, the Vice President of Cloud Channel Sales for Ingram Micro. Uh, so now this is an interview you did uh, without me because, well, I guess I just get left out of things these days. Isn't that true? <laughs> no, we desperately wanted you there. <laughs> <laughs> now, unfortunately, I had a uh, family uh, uh, it, uh, thing to deal with and uh, I was not able to make it for this. But uh, I'm really glad you went and did the interview. So why don't we... Um, anything you want to do to set this up since I, I, I haven't got a chance to actually watch it yet because uh, I just got back late last night. Uh, set, set this up for us, Rich. Well, you know, in, in a way, the conversation we, we just had with Eric sets this up perfectly because um, it's really a very similar uh, set of topics that we talked about with, uh, with Tim. Tim pretty much runs uh, Ingram's cloud business in the Americas uh, these days. Uh, and, and you know, in the last episode, I think it was, I was boasting about how lucky I get sometimes. <laughs> I, I got lucky again on this. So I, we, I've been working with Ingram for a while now to get one of their cloud executives on the show. And for, for various reasons, we couldn't make it come together. And we finally sort of found a date that worked. We booked it. And then last week, I believe it was, um, Ingram published a, a report. They're calling it their um, cloud technology uh, state of the channel report and uh, but it came out just in time for this interview and, and provided a nice uh, sort of foundation for a conversation with Tim about um, what trends they're seeing in cloud computing, what trends they anticipate for the future and and what sorts of uh, best practices their most successful partners have uh, adopted. Awesome. So we'll go ahead. We'll, uh, we'll cut to break. And then when we come back, we'll, be, we'll play that interview. And then, of course, we'll be back after that with part three uh, for some five questions with Eric Long, as well as uh, some regular end of the show features. So you won't want to miss any of it. Stick around. We'll be right back. All right. So we're joined by Tim Fitzgerald from Ingram Micro. Um, Tim, thanks so much for uh, making some time for us today. Hey, Rich, it's a pleasure to be with you again. Now, you and I have uh, spoken before. I'm sure there are some folks in the audience who are less familiar with you and what you do. So just tell folks a little bit about you and your role at uh, Ingram Micro. Yeah, certainly, Rich. Uh, it's been, you know, 30 years of a technology career, all anchored in the channel. And I have the privilege of leading the America's Cloud Channel Organization for Ingram Micro. So that spans, of course, North America, Central, and, uh, and Latin America. And uh, it's certainly uh, an exciting time to have that opportunity. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, th this, this has been the year to be in cloud computing for sure. Um, part of the reason that uh, we're speaking today, actually, is just within the last couple of weeks or so, Ingram Micro uh, published its uh, cloud technology state of the channel report. Um, one of the things that report observed, which I'm sure a lot of folks in our audience have, have felt and noticed as well, is just um, the degree to which the pandemic and the work from home trend have really accelerated a lot of things around cloud computing and elsewhere that were already happening. So let's just look at this from an Ingram Micro standpoint, from the standpoint of your marketplace. I mean, what, what kind of changes, what kind of impact have you seen um, this year from the pandemic on uh, cloud adoption trends just out of your marketplace? Yeah, Rich, I, you almost can't read an article <clears throat> about the deployment of technology solutions that doesn't address the point that you're bringing up. This whole notion of acceleration, I think brought on by many of the solutions that are today delivered in an as a service model. So think of collaboration, think of any kind of video conferencing like we're using here for your podcast. Uh, think of virtual desktop solutions, and of course, the security that ensures that all of these deployed solutions are well governed and managed such that they're protected. There are opportunities for partners everywhere as digital transformation accelerates. And of course, those solutions I mentioned are just a handful of areas where we're seeing new and exciting opportunity. 
So, you know, one of the ways that I uh, will sometimes uh, approach the, the pandemic's impact on the industry is to um, look at both the issues that um, folks in our audience were dealing with in those first weeks, you know, the, the March, April kind of time frame where mm -hmm. you're in a scramble to get everybody online and productive, and then how things have maybe evolved or changed since then. So, I mean, some of the tools that you were talking about before there, I'm sure were, you know, it was just an urgent need. I've got to get this out to my customer immediately. But, I, you know, here we are in September. Are, are you seeing emerging opportunities? Do you see opportunities down the road, um, new cloud products and solutions and so on that um, are being adopted or you think will be adopted in greater numbers going forward? Yeah, I, I don't know that I can draw a, a very specific correlation between the time right after this work from home global pandemic impact happened to what it looks like today. We've seen a continual evolution of accelerated growth across many of the solutions that I previously mentioned. I would add in the area of infrastructure as a service, we're seeing a tremendous growth opportunity for partners. We're seeing many end clients looking to do a deeper assessment of the workloads that have a greater sense of urgency to be either replatformed or migrated to be consumed on many of the hyperscalers that we represent. So continuing to see opportunities around anything virtual work from home related. And I mentioned a couple of those solutions. Of course, with that new environment, there's an assessment of the need for greater security or additional security. So across the broad portfolio that Ingram has the privilege of representing, we're seeing opportunity across that entire spectrum. Uh, and then lastly, from a workload migration perspective, an accelerated opportunity for partners to work with their clients around assessing their full broad portfolio of applications or workloads and really determine a, a plan or a model by which they will be deployed to the rightful place long term and then establishing a timeline for which that will happen. That may appear as an accelerated growth opportunity, but I don't believe that that's necessarily going to be a short lived accelerated growth opportunity. We see continued acceleration there as the IaaS space has been an exciting and really a meteoric growth opportunity for partners for some period of time. I mean, do you think the experiences that end users that, uh, you know, small and mid-sized businesses have had with the cloud this year have um, made them more receptive to, more interested in some of that workload migration that maybe their partners have been encouraging them to do in the past and they've kind of taken their time about? Yeah, it, from my vantage point, based on what I'm hearing and talking to customers, it's sort of a tale of two cities there are certain more complex workloads that customers may think, I'm gonna put that a little bit later in the timeline as I look across my entire portfolio of workloads, but there are also those workloads that they'd already been planning, but it appears that there's an accelerated timeline to get that move to happen. So again, my experience has been most customers are looking for some form of help not necessarily relying exclusively on their own IT staff. So in addition to the opportunity to resell the consumption of infrastructure as a service services, there's a great consulting assessment implementation opportunity, a migration opportunity for sure for those partners that have those competencies. Now, one of the um, interesting trends that you folks spoke about in, in the report, and this is the kind of thing that Ingram would be perfectly situated to see, uh, basically, but the report noted that there is some consolidation um, happening in the industry, um, you know, partly with help from private equity money, but um, some consolidation within the vendor community. Uh, and there was a, a thought that that could lead over time to price increases uh, on cloud solutions, which in turn, um, could make bundled cloud offerings more attractive to, uh, in particular, an SMB uh, client base. So, I mean, talk a little bit about that, both the, the consolidation that you may see happening and the thought that bundled um, uh, offerings as a result of that consolidation could be even more attractive to uh, end users. Yeah, Rich, certainly for the audience that I think you're addressing, there's certainly been a lot of news over really the entire period of 2020 
related to companies acquiring other companies, building up strategic competency, expanding their footprint and expanding their capability. And, uh, you know, it's an exciting time to see that kind of opportunity for partners out there. At the same time, we also see customers continue to demand increased efficiency in how they're sourcing their IT solutions. And that's also true whether they're as a service solutions. So that notion of driving for greater simplicity, greater cost efficiency, many customers are looking to source more and more cloud offerings from fewer and fewer providers, which is a great opportunity for partners to be more meaningful, more valuable to their end clients by representing a broader portfolio. So a lot of movement, and I think what that points to is a continued desire for the most efficient provider to be successful in providing support to our partners as their customers are looking for a more efficient way to consume more and more IT solutions. Do you have any um, uh, recommendations, any best practices you tend to share with your partners about uh, the most uh, effective, uh, most profitable, most highly uh, adopted uh, approaches to, to bundling cloud solutions? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of different things that come to my mind, Rich. You remember a couple of years ago at Cloud Summit, we announced sort of a roadmap. We called it the Cloud Awesomeness Roadmap, which really allows for a partner to assess where they are in their own maturity journey, if you will, in becoming more digitally enabled to be able to provide some of those needs that I highlighted that end customers are looking for. Uh, so that's a great place for partners to start. We also provide, and it's probably most notably in our infrastructure as a service area, a nine step methodology that very specifically addresses those areas to allow a partner to develop best practices in meeting their client needs when they're assessing those workloads or applications that might need to be migrated to a hyperscaler deployment model. So there's a couple of things that are available there. I think that um, certainly growth rates would indicate are super valuable to the partners that we serve today that other partners could take advantage of. So I do, I do remember the, uh, the, the awesomeness roadmap uh, that you guys introduced at the Cloud Summit a few years back. Uh, and there were different stages of cloud maturity, basically, that you, you broke that roadmap into. I mean, if you look at the, the upper end, the, the most mature partners, I mean, j just give folks a sense for maybe two or three uh, of the things that those really sort of leading edge, most mature cloud solution providers do that the, um, the newer entrants into the marketplace tend not to do and, and learn to do over time. Yeah, Rich, what comes to my mind, and it's certainly not the only area, is what we do in that roadmap that I think really helps partners digitally identify customers for the solutions that they're offering. So you might remember uh, at one last year, we spoke about the uh, go-to-market hub. That's a repository for all these digital assets, playbooks, sell sheets, things to really enable the sales organization within our partners to be able to deliver solution proposals to their clients in one of the most efficient ways. So serving up those digital assets allows the partner to be very efficient at digitally identifying new potential end customers for the newer solutions that they're adding to the portfolio. That digital, digitally enabled marketing, if you will, and the ability to provide full solution competency back to the customers is a key accelerant and one of those identifiers in that last stage of that maturity cloud awesomeness roadmap. Now, you know, uh, at least by reputation, and you, you might correct me on this, but I mean, I, I think when a typical channel pro in our audience thinks about cloud computing, they, they tend to think about the, uh, the products themselves, you know, the, the licenses as relatively low margin opportunities and its services that turn a cloud offering into something that's, that's gonna be highly profitable for them. So, I mean, what, what is the, the role, the recommended role um, of services in a cloud offering from your standpoint? How should uh, folks in our audience um, think about combining services with the cloud software and infrastructure itself? 
Yeah, great point and a great opportunity for increased value and profitability for the partners. You know, at the end of the day, if you think about it, end customers are looking for help. They're on their own journey to better meet the needs of their clients. And so they're looking for someone who can come in, understand their business, and then make recommendations about how they can better serve the needs of their clients in maybe a more efficient, more scalable way. What a tremendous opportunity for partners to engage and assess, begin to design a roadmap for that customer for all of their cloud needs, implement those needs, and then manage them through their useful life. That particular roadmap, I think, gives a great opportunity and multiple opportunities for partners to deliver services to their client. Clearly, the delivery of professional consulting and implementation services, managed services in general, are a huge profitability component for a partner as they're delivering more meaningful value back to their end client. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that all cloud services are this low margin, as I think your question sort of implied. There continue to be a great um, wealth of opportunities within the portfolio for partners to get to really exciting margins. But I think there's always an opportunity to deliver greater value to their clients in a customer intimate way but delivering this breadth of managed services and certainly provide a greater opportunity to retain greater levels of profitability by complementing the resold services with that band of services, if you will. So that, uh, that ties into something else from the report that I wanted to um, speak with you about a little bit, which was um, an observation uh, made towards the end of the report, if I remember right, that um, going forward, um, cloud service providers, uh, you know, partners like your partners are going to need to be problem solvers to their customers uh, more than resellers, say. Um, so, I mean, it, it, tell me a little bit about, you know, why you think that is and, and what that might mean for uh, just in terms of uh, the uh, services that they deliver and, and the, the business model that they adopt. What, what does it mean for your partners to really um, begin to think of themselves more and position themselves more as problem solvers uh, to their customers? And why is that so important to do? Yeah, so Rich, this is a topic that's certainly near and dear to my heart. If you think about it, we're living through one of the most exciting times in our industry. There's been an explosion of independent software vendors and, and really folks that are focused on generating their own IP. If you apply this to solution integrators and, and value-added resellers, we see the customization of solutions to really meet the tailored needs of their clients. And that generation of IP quite often can be applied to other like customers. Well, so if you think about that model, and you identify those partners that are creating their own IP, they become innovators and innovators in search of multiple routes to market. So we find some of these creators of IP think independent software vendors or those folks doing uh, services delivery work can become vendor providers, if you will, through the model that Ingram Micro Cloud Marketplace supports. And we're seeing many, many partners looking for uh, go-to-market acceleration by leveraging these different ecosystems. And again, to me, that's what indicates this being one of the most exciting times in our industry because the plethora of innovators are looking to leverage the broader community that will apply that IP and apply it based on customer intimate knowledge in a value-added way. So a great bi-directional margin opportunity for the entire partner ecosystem. So Tim, we, we were talking uh, off the air before the interview about how uh, you folks at Ingram are you know, in the midst of the 2021 planning process. We, we are at Channel Pro as well. I'm sure a lot of people sure. are thinking ahead, looking ahead to next year. I know you can't talk about um, any specific plans that in Ingram has, but in the back of your mind, you have to have certain expectations about maybe what what trends might show up, what, what next year might look like, just broadly speaking, for cloud computing. As you look down the road uh, ahead to 2021, I mean, what, what kinds of thoughts do you have about what cloud computing could look like next year? 
Um, you know, Rich, if the, the last year has taught me nothing, uh, what it's taught me is our visibility into the future to anticipate what things might be is uh, cloudy at best, to pardon the pun. Um, but, but with that being said, I think as I've indicated really throughout the entire discussion, there are lots of opportunities for partners that are willing to make those bold uh, commitments to areas of competency growth that I think provide exciting opportunities. Um, certainly the rate at which digital transformation is happening has been uh, uh, quoted in many different articles that are out there. So I'll leave it to your readers to interpolate for them what that might mean, but it's certainly an exciting time and a tremendous opportunity for growth, specifically in as a service. And, and if, if I could be so bold as to say, we've certainly been hard at work at Ingram, making sure that we're best prepared to support our partners that want to capture that opportunity with their customers. Okay. Well, this is your first time uh, on the show, so you, you probably aren't aware that when Matt and I do an interview together with an interview guest, we, we have a long history of playing a game we like to call five questions, which is where we, the two of us kind of alternate and we ask our interview guest five <laughs> totally random, spontaneous questions about themselves that have nothing to do with the tech industry. Just We just want to know more about you. So I, I won't give you the whole five questions treatment all on my own. I, I'm just, I know Matt would be disappointed if I didn't ask one question. Though. So I'm going to give you one five questions style question uh, to answer. Good. And I, I am the guy, I always go to the food questions. So I'm, I'm just, I'm going to go to the food question. <laughs> Give me your, your three favorite omelet ingredients beyond the eggs and, and the milk and so on. You know, you're, you're, you're picking toppings or, uh, or mix-ins for the omelet. What are your three favorites? Oh, that's a good one. Um, uh, more recently, I'm probably going more healthy. So <clears throat> I will say things like tomatoes and mushrooms and probably a Swiss cheese. <coughs> and if you were thinking unhealthy, what, what's uh, the probably, stuff you no longer permit yourself? Yeah, it probably looks a little more like a meat lovers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, Tim Fitzgerald, thank you so much for uh, uh, making some time for us. I really appreciate it. I, um, I'll let the audience know, um, please check out uh, the show sheet for this episode. I will have a link to that report. Uh, that I was talking about there. Uh, Tim, where can folks listening or, or watching right now learn more about you and more about Ingram Micro Cloud? Yeah, probably the best place to find me is on LinkedIn and you can search on Fitz AZ. That's F-I-T-Z-A-Z -Z, as in Arizona. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn there and, and connect with me. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tim Fitzgerald. <music>
<laughs> it is what it is. Florida, it's beautiful. So, how good. Might as well. Yeah. So for those who are watching uh, or who are listening, we, we, Eric was talking and then like, he's got a virtual background up with like a palm tree behind him. And this, this person just kind of like <laughs> magically appeared right behind him. Cause you know, how the virtual desktop things work is it, they, someone, it's, it'll be kind of be hidden until it's like in the right spot and then it'll, it'll uncover them in the virtual background. So it was like, she, she was a specter that appeared behind. She him. just wanted to say hi to Rich. <laughs> <laughs> and who doesn't want to say hi to Rich, right? Yes, it's true. Cool. All right. Well, good stuff. Um, so, Eric, we're going to play five questions. Have we, have we played this game with you in the past? I believe we have. I don't know how well I did last time, but we'll try well, it again. We will see. So we're going to go and we'll say five more questions with, uh, with Eric Long. So for those who are new to the, uh, to the podcast here or have never listened or watched before, it's one of our kind of more popular segments now. Uh, people seem to really like it. Basically, Rich and I come up with five questions to ask our guest or interviewee. Uh, off the top of our heads, whatever we can possibly think of, it could be about anything and everything, no gotchas or anything like that, or anything to try and, and embarrass you. That's not the goal here, but it's uh, to to get to learn a little bit more about you and to to have a little bit of fun. So you ready? I am unembarrassable. Go go ahead. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> Rich, question number one to you. Okay. Uh, so I, I haven't done it as much in, in recent years. There, there was a, a, an extended period in my life where every summer I would go on this pretty long road trip uh, to meet up with friends, you know, every August. And I, I used to really in, enjoy that for, for whatever reason. We don't, um, I don't drive. I tend to fly to this get together now. But, um, but I, I, I do consider myself something of a, a, a fan of road trips. And you do. You, you've lived out of an RV, you dro- travel back and forth between Texas and Florida. What, what's your, what's maybe a good road trip tip, like a fun thing to do when you're spending an extended uh, period of time out in the road like that, like literally out in the road <laughs> driving? Well, you got to plan a little bit because, uh, you know, the RV thing, you have to have a place to go. Um, I happen to have a generator, which is kind of cool. So, you know, we've got these things called harvest hosts, which are like wineries and breweries and things like that. You can stay overnight for free. Uh, and so I like randomizing things and just kind of, you know, not really knowing where you go in the next day. But if you're going to go stay somewhere for two or three weeks, you got to plan those things ahead of time. So I would say, I think my favorite so far has been uh, the Goshen Heartland Rally, which was up in Indiana and stayed for 10 days, rented a golf cart, and they had all kinds of events and dinners and everything. And we just kind of hung out with a bunch of 300 and I think 40 other or, or fifth wheels, specific fifth wheels. So that was kind of cool. Um, the, the other part is just to do the random stuff, go down to the keys or, you know, just pick a place and, and start heading that direction. Very cool. I will build off that with question number two. As someone, you said you've done a lot of road trips, got the fifth wheel behind you. What is the craziest thing you've stopped to see based on a sign you saw on the highway? I don't think I should answer that question. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but it, yes, you but it's north, <laughs> but it's north of Ocala, and they they serve donuts naked. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so I'd probably move on from that question. As long as, as as long as you're not on your work PC while you're uh, while you're being served naked donuts, I think you're uh, you're all right. Now, were the donuts naked um, or were the people naked? Um, or the both. Donuts were fully dressed. The people were <laughs> naked. <laughs> so I, I can imagine the kind of people who might work at a donut place. Um, is the, are these people that you would have wanted to see naked? Yeah, they were professionals. Ah, okay. <laughs> Say no more. Just send pictures. Not through your work PC. Rich, okay, you question number, th- number three to you. <laughs> Well, I, I think we could probably devote the rest of the questions to, to the Naked Donut Shop. And I mean, I'm just thinking about hair nets and, uh, but we'll, we'll drop that uh, and we'll, we'll just move on. So, uh, you know, people always say about um, certain climates, well, it's hot, but it's a dry heat. So you, you, you split time between two places that get hot, Florida and, and Texas. Given the choice, which, do you like the dry heat? Or the not so dry heat. Well, they're neither are really dry heat. Uh, one is just like sweltering, like ninety nine percent humidity. That'd be Florida, and the other is probably around seventy percent humidity. So not a lot of difference between the two. I would say Florida probably would be the preference since I'm from Florida uh, because we get uh, the sea breezes in the afternoon, and so you'll get that afternoon thunderstorm pretty much like clockwork throughout the summer. 
you'll get uh, some pretty good breezes. We're right on the water. So, you know, it's, 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 um, we're not far from the Gulf of Mexico. So kind of a little bit different where Texas can just be a steam bath sometimes, but uh, in North Texas, Dallas, um, it gets pretty damn hot, but it also snows and then it hails and then they have tornadoes. Um, so I think weather and weather up there is more treacherous than it is here. We pre plan for hurricanes. I got hurricane shutters and beer. You know, it's, we're done. Yeah, for those who are watching, there's a good breeze going on behind you there, but for some reason, your hair is just staying um, perfectly still. Yeah. I already got some crit criticism of the hair earlier because it's kind of flat, but it's Florida. I'm, I'm in shorts. I haven't worn shoes in my last three days. So, you know, it's like, eh. All right. At least I comb my hair. <laughs> we'll take it. And at least you're wearing clothes and you're not uh, eating donuts naked. Uh, so let's go. Question number four, which we, we kind of got the ball rolling with omelets, but I don't want to ask the same question, but there are lots of really great ways to make an omelet. What is the worst way? What is the worst omelet you've ever had? <laughs> Barbara's. Uh, she cannot cook. She makes <laughs> toast that has bones in it. It's just it's like ugh, horrible horrible but anybody that takes the eggs and cracks them in the pan with no fat of any sort is not a cook and that that's uh, that would not be a good even a nonstick pan you gotta have a, like a little flavoring even though i can't eat butter so i use fake butter so we gotta have the uh the 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 best the the, the worst omelet is the non-fat filled variety in a with, uh, without with, stirring with that you, you got to stir the eggs up first you need a little you got to whip a little air into them yeah a little, little milk or cream kind of fluffing them up a little bit no no milk or cream just no egg. milk just eggs just eggs just eggs i worked on a on a breakfast line i made i have made so many omelets uh you, yeah thousands and thousands of omelets i've made so, so what would you say then uh, um, is question 4b uh what <laughs> what is your favorite omelet then that you've well, made. That I've made, um, all of them. I just, I just make a damn good omelet or a frittata. <laughs> I make a good frittata as well, but I, you know, I don't eat eggs any longer. Um, so I have this little vegetable thing that, that says it's egg, but it's not really egg. It's, I don't know how they make this stuff. It's kind of like, you know. You don't want to know or you wouldn't eat it. Yeah, I don't know. But it makes, you can't really flip an omelet with it. You have to kind of like scrape it and do a scramble. But no, a, a good omelet, hell, a Western omelet. Um, yeah. I, I, I can't help myself. I got to go to 4C here because, uh, you know, the, <laughs> you're working the omelet line and I just, I want like how, um, let's, let's just say on a Sunday at 11 a.m., you know, assuming that you worked that hour, like how, how many omelets are you turning out and how fast are you doing them? Well, you're going to run four pans and you were probably going to take about two to three minutes per omelet. So you're going to do the math on that one. And yeah, you flip it in the pan, get really good at that. It takes a commitment. You got to have commitment. You can't, can't half-ass flip it. You got to flip it. That's a lot of omelets. That is a lot, a lot of omelets. omelets. It's a lot of omelets. We uh, we'll have to take the uh, the omelet one hundred one class uh, by Eric Long here down the way, so we learn how to make omelets really fast. All right, uh, Rich, well, I'll give you question number five. Go ahead. Uh, gosh, what do I got? Well, okay, so um, you, you've got three sets of golf clubs. None of them is maybe uh, you know better, They're all defective, but. Uh, <laughs> What, what, what's maybe the uh, the strongest and weakest part of your game? God, you want me for real? Um, no, why do we say that? Let's see. Um, the weakest part. The strongest part is I typically manage to bring a little small bottle of vodka out to the course when we play. And so, you know, we, we've got like, you know, some cocktails with us. Keep in mind that the golf carts, uh, you know, cart girls have been a little sporadic over the last few months. So, you know, you pretty much have to self-serve. Um, the weakest part is that damn driver. Let's just, let's just put that thing away. Just put off the tee. That's pretty much it. <laughs> you guys golf? You know, it's, it's been ages and ages since I've done it, but I used, I used to do it. Uh, it, it. Well, it's a whole other story, but yeah, I, um, trust me, you, you are PGA level golf versus my game, but, uh, but I could putt a little bit, I could, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, beyond that, it was just hopeless. I, 
I'm an excellent putter. I'm Tiger Woods in like three or four holes, and then I'm happy Gilmore and the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I don't get out much. I, I do have a set of golf clubs, and I, I do like to go to the driving range on occasion and, and uh, hit some balls. And, you know, I take the kids to the, the, you know, the mini golf. I'm not very good at that, but, I, you know, I, I, I will go. But I don't get out to, like, an actual golf course very often if like i can't even i couldn't even tell you if i've been to one in all of this last decade but um no i did go once but it's, it's actually off. that's actually good news because i hate playing behind people like that <laughs> 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 i watch too much golf channel you know and they you know they set up like uh like uh you know 30 seconds over a putt a minute over a putt so we just put the damn ball just get it over with. You're going to miss it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a guarantee. Well, that was fun. Uh, fun playing five questions. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we'll make sure that we uh, have five more questions for you the next time that you are on. Right. Uh, Rich, we're going to move on to our museum pick. So um, I was saving this for, I was going to do this pick last week when, uh, but we, we went ahead and gave um, our guest host, he had a, a pretty cool HP old laptop that he wanted to put, bring on and talk about it. And so I'm, uh, I've, I've got to, I'm going to have mine this week. So it's an HP uh, product pick because that was kind of the theme last week with all of the news stories. And I'm going to hold it up here. So for those who are watching on YouTube, I got to hold this thing up, but I got to pick it up off the ground. So I'm going to disappear for a second. But um, it's, a, it's a kind of a very big thing. I went down into the basement. So I, I grabbed a, an old HP desktop. I'll hold it up here. And for those who are um, listening, this is a, well, Rich, how would you describe this? It's a desk <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> a big white box, just like the kind that used to sit in a lot of desks. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out what those drives are. Yeah, this is the HP Vectra VL. Uh, it, it rocks the, well, it has Intel inside, Eric, an MMX processor, even. The Intel Pentium 2 is what's, uh, what's in this thing. It looks like it's got a CD drive and a CD, I believe this is a burner. Yes, so one, one CD only reader, and then there is a CD burner for naturally copying CDs. There's a, a floppy disk in there. Now this one could, could stand up uh, this way. You could have it as a little tower, but most people set it uh, uh, horizontally on their desks and put their gigantic CRT monitors on top. Um, on the back, it's got a parallel port. I wanna see if I can spin it around here. This thing's, it's pretty heavy and hard to get on camera here. So I'll spin it around. You know, all the ports one would need, Eric. There's, the, uh, there's a parallel back there. There's a VGA port. There's a serial. There's PS2. Um, I thought you were going to be too young to identify the parallel port there for a second. So I'm, I'm <laughs> oh, impressed. I'm, 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 impressed. Uh, I'm familiar. I'm familiar. And I can't believe you didn't find an older PC than that. That's relatively modern. I, I have older. Don't, don't get me wrong. I have older. <laughs> uh, but there's a funny story behind this one. So um, that particular PC was acquired... At the, end of a, at the end of someone's driveway, it was basically garbage. Uh, and, I, and I set out to do a project to get to build a garage PC entertainment system. I, I managed to find this old receiver with some speakers. And, um, what I, and what I wanted to find was some kind of computer that I could load on like, you know, uh, some, some M, put, put MP3s on and could could maybe stream um, video from uh, my sling box that was inside the house, if you remember what those things were. And so I found this at the end of, the, at the end of the, someone's driveway as garbage, so I just grabbed it and uh, cleaned it up and managed to make it a, a usable garage kind of entertainment system. Found this old CR, small CRT monitor sat on top of it, and it worked actually quite well uh, for many years. And if I turned it on today, it probably stood, will, would still work. This originally had, I'm trying to remember what I had on it when I, when I picked it up, but it was like Windows 95, if I remember correctly. I got it to run Windows XP, because at the time when I put this together, that was kind of the, the, the OS that was out at the time. Uh, it had, I want to say 128 megabytes of RAM after I upgraded it, but it's, it's been a while since I, I played with this thing, but I found it down in the graveyard and thought it'd be a fun one to share uh, today. So, Eric, do you ever do anything, any fun, fun stuff like that? Old computers, throw them out in a garage or find, repurpose them for other things? Because that was kind of a big hobby of mine back in the day was to find new uses for old, old useless machines. 
I'm a purger, unfortunately. So I, I'm a minimalist from the standpoint of stuff being scattered around. And I'm kind of disappointed in that because it'd be really cool to set up a shelf back here with all the old stuff that, you know, we used to have. And uh, so I'm going to have to go out and find some gear. But no, I, I don't keep stuff laying around too long. Rich, no, he's seen it offhand how much old crap I have <laughs> laying around here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's kind of a fun one. And I was looking back, because we were talking earlier about a PC in 2006. Now, this one is, was older than 2006. So not a good representative model of what a computer was like in 06. But um, I found, I found a, a high-end desktop that came out in 2006. And it had a Core 2 uh, Duo processor. But this was around the Core and Core 2 uh, era. Uh, two gigs of RAM, which was probably a lot in 2006. One was probably more of the standard. Uh, 250 gig hard drive, um, graphics card. Uh, this was also the same year that AMD bought ATI. So that would have been, you know, a high-end card then would have been like the, the 19, X1900 or like the 7800 GTX, uh, 7900 GTX line if you were going to spend a lot of money. Um, it would have... Let's see, what else would, it, would have been in here? SLI was around back then. Uh, oh, this is when they had, uh, you could get them with separate physics accelerator cards. You remember those, Eric? Accelerator, no. uh, hardware <laughs> accelerator cards? No, for physics? Vague, sort of vaguely, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so, so actually, you know, it's actually, it's not really very usable in 2020, but that's not so bad. If you were to find a 14-year-old computer laying around today, well, this was a high-end one back in the day. This also, also this one back in the day cost about four thousand mm. dollars, which was a lot. So that was definitely not the norm of a computer 14 years ago. Yeah, fun stuff. Rich, you have you have any old machines you did stuff with, or are you you a purger too? I am mostly a purger. Although I, I mean, that said, I've I've got probably the last three or four. Uh, laptops that I've used stacked up in a, in a closet. I haven't quite, you know, cleansed those and gotten the data off of them. And, and, and I really should, uh, actually, because there, there are people who need them now. But, uh, but yeah. I've got an iWatch 3. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Not super old, but, uh, but getting there. But getting there. Very cool. All right. Uh, well, I, I do have a tech pick lined up. So with all of the HP things that we've uh, talked about over the last couple shows. Uh, I wanted to pick a non-HP computer this time for my tech pick. So uh, I like to play a little That Was Then, This Is Now. So my tech pick this week is uh, a Lenovo Think Center M90S small form factor. These are pretty new. Let me see if I can uh, go ahead and get this on the screen here for those who are watching on, on video. Click that and that and that and there it is right there. So these start at around 600 bucks. Uh, you, can, you can put these uh, flat horizontal like this old guy here that I have or you can kind of set it upright. Uh, this is a small form factor desktop, so it's pretty small. 10th uh, gen core processors of the V-Pro. Um, a bunch of USB inputs and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's a, basically a small desktop computer. So, but they're nice looking. They're nice looking. Eric, you do, you do any Lenovo desktops? You played around with those at all? We do. Actually, that's our primary desktop. You know what's funny about that? I don't recognize that model. <laughs> this, one's, so, this one's really new. I think this one just consumer? came out. It's, it's oh, pretty okay. new. Okay, yeah. No, um, typically, we're doing the tinies, sliding them in the back, a tiny in one monitors to neaten up the desktops. That's uh, pretty much our, our MO for quite some time now. Yeah, these are a little bigger. These are a little more high power than the tiny, um, yeah. the tiny desktops, but... Uh, but they're pretty not. But they're, they're actually still pretty small, all things considered. Uh, I'm trying to find a, the full specs list on it here. So, uh, 10th gen Intel cores, four terabyte SSDs, up to is all up to stuff. Uh, up to three terabytes of uh, spinning hard drive, AMD Radeon graphics. Um, let's see how much RAM you can stuff in one of these. Probably quite a bit. M.2 SSD support, optional DVD RW. Eric, was the last time you used a DVD drive? I'm trying to remember yeah, the last time I, I used it. It's been years. I mean, it's been years. I, I barely use a printer. <laughs> you know, so it's... Uh, I use it's, I use the printer a lot. I, I do have, like, because the desktop I built last year doesn't use, like, I, would, I'm, I was like a stalwart my whole life of having twin optical drives. Um, 
and the, and then I, I finally realized like, what was the last time I used an optical drive? So I didn't, I didn't build one in my new desktop. Can't, it doesn't even support it. But then like, of course, about five months, I ended up having to actually put a DVD in to get data off of something for somebody that I was helping them out with. So I had to go and find like a little external one, uh, USB model to plug into it. But it's rare. It's so rare to use optical these days. Rich, when was the last time you used an optical drive? Oh, it's been, I, I, I couldn't even tell you. It's been years. <laughs> yeah, long time, long time. Interesting stuff. All right, well, that's my tech pick. Uh, the Lenovo M90 small, M90S, small form factor. My museum pick, the old HP Vectra VL Pentium 2 uh, rocket, uh, rocket machine back in, I don't know when that came out, probably uh, mid-90s early 90s somewhere somewhere in the late 90s or very early 2000s uh for that particular one so oh, i have the 90s i had windows 95 on it so maybe like 96 98 when was the pentium 2 a thing eric all right the early 2000s i believe all right we gotta check uh, we gotta uh, check like, pentium 2 i was never a big speeds and feeds guy so, you know we're all about applications so I, I was brain. always I was always all, all about the hardware. May of 1997, so that would peg this machine somewhere in the 97 and probably 98, wow. 99 range. Uh, but that was a long that was a long time ago, Rich. Yeah. Back when dinosaurs roamed the earth looking for Pentium chips to eat. It doesn't seem that long ago. It really doesn't, but it really was, <laughs> which which makes me sad and makes me want to go to a, a, a naked donut shop. All right, uh, Rich, why don't you tell us what we might have missed over the last week and look in your crystal ball and tell us what might be coming down the road. Well, you know, the, the great place, the best place to go find out what you may have missed this week is our In Case You Missed It column, uh, which appears every Friday on ChannelProNetwork.com, written for us by James Gaskin. Um, this week, he's going to talk about all the news that came out of Microsoft Ignite. Microsoft hosted a, a big conference this week. We haven't uh, even talked about it on this show, but that's okay, because James is going to summarize all the, uh, the highlights from Ignite for you there. Um, speaking of uh, PCs, we, he's going to have some news for you about some new uh, gaming rigs from HP and Razer that came out this week. And then he'll also have some thoughts uh, for you about a, uh, a new blue jeans option. If you're in the market for new jeans, um, there is a, a blue jeans product that you can buy if you have a lot more money than good sense. And uh, you'll see what we're talking about uh, when you read about this. Um, and now looking ahead to next week, um, it's actually kind of a big uh, conference week. So first and foremost, VMworld is happening online uh, next week. So you can expect some news out of VMware. Um, IT Glue is hosting its annual uh, GlueX conference online next week as well. Uh, the 20 is doing its uh, vision conference for members and uh, people who are considering becoming members. And of course, we at Channel Pro will be uh, doing, uh, hosting an event for our readers in uh, Canada. So lots happening next week. Excellent. Sounds very good. Well, that is going to wrap up episode 161. Eric, thank you so much for being on and joining us uh, this week as guest host. I'll get for the third time, I should say, and I hope we will get you back for a fourth. For those who want to learn a little bit more about uh, TerraCloud and a little bit more about you, what, where can they reach out? How can they find you? Uh, TerraCloud.us. Pretty, pretty easy. Only one R, though. There's my 3CX going off again. I should have muted that. <laughs> <laughs> and are you uh, are you on the socials? Are you on the LinkedIn, the Facebooks, any of those? All over the LinkedIn and and the, the that internet thing. So yeah, you'll find us on. Uh, I think I, I have Twitter. I have no idea why I have Twitter, um, but TerraCloud Inc. over on Twitter, and uh, it's just TerraCloud up on Facebook and LinkedIn. And we're pretty active on LinkedIn. Facebook, I just tend to piss a lot of people off. So I try not to spend a lot of time there. <laughs> you do. I, I I'm connected with you on Facebook, and you are Oops. you are really good at pissing people off. Uh, but it's, it's always lots of fun to, to, to watch and read. Uh, so Eric, thank you again so much for being here. Uh, for those who are out there, to subscribe to Channel Pro Weekly is the best way to keep, uh, keep track of what's going on here uh, in, in the industry and here on Channel Pro Weekly. So subscribe at iTunes uh, or Apple, what is it? Apple Podcasts, it's not really iTunes Podcasts, it's Apple Podcasts, Google, Google Play Podcasts, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, pretty much anywhere where you can get podcast you will find us there if you like to watch we are on youtube subscribe to our channel hit the red button and the bell so you get notifications when we have new episodes channelpronetwork.com is the website should be your start page make sure every time you turn on your web browser that page opens up so you can get the latest news articles white papers downloads important information that you need to not only keep keep abreast of what's going on but also to help you uh with your business and uh, help you grow your business and be more profitable in many 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 ways 
including some awesome uh, contributions by even Mr. Eric Long himself, as well as the great writings of Mr. Rich Freeman. Uh, it, we, are, uh, we are also on the socials. We're Channel 4 Network on Facebook. We're at Channel 4 SMB on Twitter. We are Channel 4 Network on LinkedIn as well. Uh, Rich, you're on the Twitters. Where can they find you? At Rich Free. And I am at Matt Whitlock on Twitter. You can find me there. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's going to wrap it up. Big thanks again to Eric Long from TerraCloud and to Tim Fitzgerald from Ingram Micro for joining us uh, for that interview. Great having him on. And we will see you all in episode 162 in two weeks. Right, Rich? Uh, no, in fact, we will have a, uh, because of the uh, conference I was talking about before, we're not going to have a whole lot of time next week, but we will have a, an abbreviated episode uh, for you uh, next week, and then we'll be back with a, uh, a full-length show uh, two weeks from now. Right, so next week is a, bu- I was getting to the bonus episode, but actually oh. 162 will be in two weeks, but we have a kind of a special bonus kind of episode that, we're, that we've uh, lined up, and I hope it'll work out well. I don't think we're, we're not going to call that 162, are we, Rich? Uh, you know, I hadn't really thought about it. I just figured as much, but maybe we won't. Maybe we won't. You'll just have to tune in next week <laughs> to find out. Uh, but we, we, we do have something in store for you next week, and we'll have a full show following the week after. So you won't want to miss it, and we will see you all then. Take care. <laughs>